Good evening. Welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Andrea Judici. I am your host. And with me, I have my guide dog, who I choose not to introduce for his focus and our safety as a team. I'm so glad that everyone tuned in tonight. As you know, we've been doing a series that I call Person and Pup to Partners. I've always been so fascinated by the paths that get followed by a puppy that is going to be a guide dog and a person who wants to be partnered with a guide dog. And that's what prompted me to do this series. We've learned about all of the steps. We've talked to a puppy raiser about what the puppies learn before they go off to guide dog school. We've talked to an orientation mobility instructor about what a person needs to do to get themselves prepared to be partnered with a guide dog. I've talked to a dog, guide dog trainer who's talked about what it is that these dogs need to learn once they have left their puppy raising home and are back at their program, learning the actual in and outs of being in harness and guiding a person who's blind. And I even got to interview myself to talk about what it was like to go away to guide dog school or to get a guide dog and also come home with that dog and the impact it has on the immediate living experience of the person who's partnered with the guide dog and also with the family. And the most recent series or the most recent topic that we covered in this series was what happens when a dog is born and starts being raised to be a guide dog puppy but follows a different path and decides that being a guide dog is not the right job. And we talked to someone who had retrained their dog, the puppy they raised to be a guide dog, it's now a service dog. We talked to someone who had adopted a retired guide dog and we talked to someone who was working with um, explosive detection dogs. So those are all dogs that were bred and raised to be guide dogs and had a different job. So finally here we are at the end of the path, sort of the the final chapter and what I like to think of as the grand finale. And that is, I now have with me today a bunch of people, four actually, um, <laughs> who are guide dog users. Every one of these folks is from a different experience in life. The things they have in common that we're gonna talk about tonight are that they're blind and they are partnered with a guide dog. And I'm going to ask them a few questions to try to get to the core of what are, what is, how has life been since they got either their first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth, whatever it is, guide dog, and what sort of differences have they found between that and traveling with a cane? I could probably talk to them about this for hours and hours and hours, but I don't have that much of time, so we're going to try to get right to it. I'm going to go around and introduce people just by their first name and then let them tell you what they choose to about themselves. I have with me tonight Randa, Nicholas, Gannon, and Steve. And I'm going to start with you, Randa. Just tell me a little bit about who you are and introduce your dog if you choose to and perhaps tell me um, where your dog is from. Okay. Well, my name's Randa. I live in a small town in Connecticut. This dog is my third guide dog and she's a female black lab from Guiding Eyes for the Blind. My second guide dog was also from Guiding Eyes for the Blind, and my first was from Fidelco, a German Shepherd. And I've had this dog for a year now, and uh, they say that it takes six to months to a year for the dog and uh, the, the handler to become a good team, and I would say we, we have. <laughs> Yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I'm going to cut in for a moment. I, I don't think I've ever told my viewing audience that um, I am currently partnered with my sixth guide dog. My first two were also from Fidelco and German Shepherds. My third, fourth, fifth, and sixth have all been from guide dogs for the blind in California. My third was also a German Shepherd and then the dogs since then have all been Labradors. And now we're to you, Nicholas. Uh, good evening, uh, Nicholas. I live in Maine, but uh, don't worry. I know this is a local uh, <laughs> television station. I grew up in Simsbury, uh, went to school here, and moved out to, up to Maine for a job. Uh, more importantly, I'm here with my dog, G. Bernard. That sounds kind of formal. Uh, he just goes by Bernie. He's more of a Bernie kind of goofy <laughs> dog. Uh, German Shepherd, tallest German Shepherd I've ever had. I've had six dogs all from Fidelco. They've all been German Shepherds. And uh, so I like German Shepherds, although they're a bit of a, they can be a challenge, uh, but <laughs> as can all dogs. Uh, am I supposed to tell something else? My no, right now you're good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Gannon? So my name is Gannon. I am also from a small town in Connecticut. 
and this is my second guide dog from Freedom Guide Dogs in upstate New York. My first guide dog was also from Freedom and he was a black lab male guide dog and I've had her for over a little bit over a year now and she's great and she helps me navigate the University of Hartford campus which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Steve. Yes, hi, Andrea. Welcome I, back. Thank, thank you for you coming for, again to my show. Thank you for having me back again. I'm Steve Famigletti. I live in Hartford, Connecticut. I work at Oak Hill, and I have my third guide dog, German Shepherd, from Guiding Eyes for the Blind. His name is Joel, and he is seven and a half years old. Thank you all again for coming this evening. I know that I made some of you very frustrated by not giving you questions, but I really <laughs> like these shows to be like conversations and I'm terrible at having notes and following a script. So I impose this upon my guests as well. Um, <laughs> and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to, it, 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 we didn't actually talk about this ahead of time, but Nicholas is actually my brother. And you may remember from last, the last episode where we had a retired guide dog and that was actually Nicholas's retired guide. Um, so that was, it's really cool to have him here now to sort of close that circle. Um, the first thing I really want to ask all of you is to talk a little bit about why you decided that a, a guide dog was the choice that you wanted to make as, for your mobility option. And we don't necessarily have to go in order. I think I'll call on Steve first. Well, thank you for calling on me first. <laughs> so I thought about getting a guide dog a long time ago. I went to a seminar when I was in the eighth grade at UConn. And when I was there, it was to give low vision and blind people a perspective about possibly attending college. And when I was there, there was a gentleman there that had a guide dog. And all I remember about that dog was it was laying on the floor next to the gentleman and it never moved. And I thought, my goodness, I think I want to have one of those dogs because they're perfect. They you don't didn't know move. he gave it Benadryl. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't do any dog things. And that kind of stuck with me. And I went to high school and then I went to college. And I started asking questions of people that didn't know the right answers about getting a guide dog. And I was told that I could not have a guide dog because I had too much vision. But I was told that by a vocational counselor, not by somebody that works at a guide dog school. So that happened when I was 21 years old and I dropped the idea completely. And when I turned 30, I had purchased a condo down in Waterbury, but I had no way of getting around independently without being afraid. I was afraid to go travel independently because I was afraid I was going to get hit by a car. And so I went to a conference in Farmington and I met people from the Fidelco Guide Dog Foundation and they had a couple of German Shepherds with them and they introduced me to these dogs and uh, I thought I would revisit the idea. So on my 30th birthday, I contacted Fidelco and got a guide dog application. My birthday is in January and I got my first guide. Her name was Whitley and I got her on July 14th of that year. And it forever changed my life because the minute that I walked with her in harness, I was not afraid to do independent travel anymore. Okay, stop. You're jumping into my next question. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, stop. <laughs> Don't talk anymore. Um, Randa. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I may, might, might be the only person in this room who lost their sight suddenly at, as an adult. I was actually 50 years old, and um, I had pet dogs, two pet dogs. So when my coworkers, because I went back to work shortly, a few months after I lost my sight, suggested that maybe I should try a guide dog, it was an easy decision for me because I've always loved dogs and knew how to take care of dogs as a pet anyway. So I did, and I did also um, go with Fidelco because they are in Connecticut. And um, it was pretty nerve wracking actually at first. I really didn't know how to be 
how to do things without vision. I got the dog too soon, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. It was only six months after I lost my sight. Wow. Yeah. And um, because I, I applied, because everybody said, oh, it's going to take a long time. <laughs> it took two months. <laughs> so anyway, I was just very nervous. But it worked out fine for a few years. And um, so, yeah, for me, it was an easy decision just because I always had always wanted do a dog in my life. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. Gannon? Um, so for me, in uh, seventh and eighth grade, my vision started to deteriorate more, so I had to start relying on using a cane to get around. And using a cane was it would it would help, but it would, like it wasn't the fastest and most efficient way to get around. So in the uh, fall of fall of my freshman year of high school, I um, attended a event for Freedom Guide Dogs called Dining in the Dark and I met the owner of Freedom and I applied to get a guide dog in the spring of that year and at the age of 16 I in April of 2012 I got my first guide dog and it made a huge difference for me in awesome traveling more and it's so I, part of why I picked all of you aside from your being fabulous people is that you each represent sort of a slightly Steve's got a little more usable vision than some people might think is a, a possibility for a guide dog Gannon is a Student, um, Randa, you, know, you lost your vision, and well, Nicholas, you know, you have to put your family on somehow. No, Nicholas also <laughs> travels a lot internationally. So, um, Nicholas, what was your reason for? Because it was really cool, and your sister had already done it. Oh no, that's not <laughs> I mean, essentially, yeah, I didn't know much about guide dogs until you know, my sister uh, got hers, and I, and, and I just realized how much more independent uh, she she became, how much more confident in traveling around and you know not that you can't travel with a cane but um it just really changed her outlook and i was going to college and i think part, so partly i really was worried about kind of that transition and wanting a dog to really that was the first time i was going to live away from home going to be in a new place i think my heart might have initially been in the wrong place as well because i noticed that um Girls like the dog yeah. <laughs> far more than they like the cane. And so I thought, well, this might be a really good thing to do when I go to college. <laughs> uh, which turns out is true, but it made a huge difference, you know, uh, honestly, in terms of independence and, and traveling on campus. And it was just one of the more freeing, most freeing things I've done uh, in my life, really. That, that My first dog and just kind of that feeling of just being like, yeah, whatever, we'll, we'll try it, we'll do it. So, yeah. Great, thank you. And that sort of brings me right into my next sort of area, which was, I know for me, there was such a dramatic difference in my willingness to do and try things that the, that the destination no longer was the ultimate or the only goal, that the getting to the destination became wonderful and enjoyable and, and not something that I um, really was dreading. And so I was wondering with the rest of you, how you felt once you became a guide dog traveler. Did you feel like it really sort of opened up your world in the perspective of your willingness to go places and do things? You've all already sort of touched on this, but I thought if we could sort of expand upon that. I know that when I'm between dogs and I'm back to using a cane, I don't like it at all. And I don't like who I become. It's, it's more like, oh gosh, you know, there's nothing in the house and I have to go someplace before I'm really willing to pick up that cane and do it. It's not because I don't have the skills. And again, there's nothing wrong with traveling with a cane. But for me personally, I'm much more timid. I'm much more, I'm less, much less confident. And I'm certainly less competent at travel when I use a cane. It's nice to not have to take it out, though. It is <laughs> nice to have to take it out. And it is nice when you get home from a busy day at work because you're tired and your dog's like, yeah, I've been on your desk all day. So I'm not tired one little bit. Um, <laughs> But so, so does anyone want to jump in and talk about sort of how you felt your life changed when you made the mobility choice to use a guide dog? Well, I can say that I felt I really didn't even learn how to use the cane really, really well. I mean, mm -hmm. I did somewhat, but with the dog, I felt like I could walk at a normal pace, not so slow and worried about tripping on something, you know, because even with a cane, you can easily miss something the dog sees more in front of you and and themselves to go around obstacles and mm -hmm. and stop at the steps and all that but i do want to say one thing that i think people the public doesn't always know and that is the the handler has to know 
where they're going ah, yes. <laughs> to, for the dog to know where to uh -huh. go. And it's not like the dog is magic and just takes you wherever you want. <laughs> you have to be able to direct the dog or learn with the dog a route, a route. <laughs> Most of the time when you see a blind person walking out in public on their own without another sighted person with a dog or a cane, it's usually, maybe not always, but from what I understand, usually because they have learned to go down this particular street and there's an intersection here and the, you know, they want to yep. learn how to go an, the, a particular route from wherever, their house or their work to the store or the bus stop or whatever. And I think that's important for people to understand. It is. I know when I applied for my first guide dog, I was all excited because I wasn't going to have to think anymore. I would just be like, <laughs> anywhere in the, in the world, yeah. I want Dunkin' Donuts and off we go. And it doesn't matter if we're in you know, Japan or America, the dog would just know. Mm -hmm. And I was very shocked when I learned that I would actually have to know where I was going and yeah. tell the dog what to do. Mm -hmm. That was a big shock to me. Right, right. <laughs> sort of spoiled a lot of my plans. I, had to, I still have to think. Go figure. Yeah. Um, anyone else want to jump in? I will. Okay. Um, so this summer, I actually worked in Boston for six weeks, and for the first whole week of the work program I did up in Boston through the Carroll Center, we actually had I had a mobility instructor, and with the dog worked with me on learning the route, how to get there from the train station, take the train, get off, switch trains, learn the route to work and back, and like it's once they know like once you like I felt more comfortable like after doing it a couple of times because like once like my dog learns her, it's like she can figure it out, like she knows it and like I feel more confident that way. But like mm -hmm. I also have to, it's a lot of like, you have to trust a dog like at first, like know where they're going. And for me at first, like when I got my first guide dog, I still had more vision back then. So like I was trusting my sight over the dog and now I just let her do what she knows what she's doing instead of, you know, trusting myself more. Mm -hmm. That's good. I know the dogs can really out us when you're doing your follow-up with your instructor and your dog starts stopping at every pub and you're like, I don't know why the dog is stopping here. Can't <laughs> imagine why the dog is stopping at every bar we go by. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they, they do out you if you go someplace pretty regularly. They will most of the time indicate that and if people are with you, they're like, why is the dog stopping at this store? Can't even imagine. And it was the peanut butter on their door jams. Um, Steve, how about you? Well, you know, as I said earlier, when I did not have a dog, I didn't travel independently. The only thing I did by myself was take my trash to the dumpster in the parking lot of the condo complex. And I did that for about a year. And I just would never think of going for a walk for the sake of going for a walk. And never would think of going to the mall or going to a restaurant. Oh my God, no, that I had to wait until I asked someone but the problem with that, as you all know, is when you ask somebody to do that, mm -hmm. it's not your reason for doing it is not good enough for them. So in other words, if you want to go to the mall, no one's going to take you to the mall if they don't have a reason to go there. So you don't have that independence. When I had my first dog, the first week after we were done with training, I walked to the mall. We had practiced the route during training. I walked to the mall by myself and I bought a pretzel. And, I, awesome. and it was like, <laughs> yeah, it's I so awesome, isn't 30 it? years of my life never mm -hmm. had that opportunity to just do something like that and didn't have to justify it to anybody. And, and, and this is not to put anybody down, but the idea that I had that independence, it just filled my soul. I can't say it any more than that. I remember walking out of the condo complex going, I never felt like this before, just independence and, you know, I have the dog to thank. And I, I'd like to add something to that. When I first worked at Oak Hill, I lived in Waterbury and I was doing a very complicated commute to and from work every day. And I know that if I did not have a guide dog at that time, that commute would have been very difficult. I don't know that I would have done it. I didn't think about it because I had the dog. I had to take two buses in the morning and three at night. It was a four and a half hour a day commute. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, Nick, so let's go to you first and then I'll go to this question. Nicholas, yeah, so I excuse think the, me. Uh, for me, the, I guess what the dog provides is, is partially, it's very individualistic, I think. So when you use a cane, 
you get different information about the environment. You spend a lot of time dealing with what I think of as low level features. So you might be using the cane to find, to trail a, a side a sidewalk or a bush or, uh, you know, so you might find there's a planter there where the dog just goes around the planter. You may not even know it's there. So a couple times recently, I, uh, I was recently uh, in Japan. I didn't take my guide dog because it's a pain over there. And it was really, really hard because I had, was so used to using the dog that I felt way less independent. Mm -hmm. But in preparing to go, I started to use the cane more, and I found lots of things in my <laughs> neighborhood that I didn't even know were there. Yeah. Um, so from that standpoint, and people that really you know, believe in the cane, and I think that's really a personal choice. I don't think there's a right or wrong. You know, think about that or talk about that as something they want to know. For me, I ultimately just want to usually want to get to where I'm going, and, and you know, if there's something along the way that I really want to know about, then that's then I'll find out about it. But if I don't know about every little uh, manhole cover on, on the way, that's fine with me. And I think that's what the dog really does. The dog kind of sees something that you might otherwise find with a cane, you have to figure out how to get around, and just goes around it. And so you kind of have this working set of eyes, this working nervous system that's kind of working with you. Um, and, and, that, and that, to me, is very much, much more efficient, but it also can be at the cost of learning something about the environment. So I think that's worth at least noting. But it was remarkable to me how, because it, over the last 20 plus years that I've used a dog, I really haven't just used a cane very much. And so on this trip that I took, um, it was, I, I just felt so much more impaired in getting around. And really, it was, it was as much about my confidence as my ability. I think I, I was doing okay getting around. I mean, sure, you, I, you know, had some challenges, but it was just more the confidence. I didn't feel like, and I would keep talking to the cane, like, oh, okay, I do that all the time. Worry, <laughs> find the stairs or whatever, you know, oh, and, that's it, funny. and it didn't do anything. So, <laughs> nor does it come when you call it, like, be loose. <laughs> That's interesting, and, and actually this brings me to something that I was thinking. So I found for myself that not only did my confidence as a, as a traveler, as getting from point A to point B um, increase, and I got my, my first guide dog right before my senior year in high school in preparation for college. Again, that whole, it's going to take six months to a year, and I thought, I don't want to start college and a new guide dog. Like, that to me doesn't make any sense. So I tried to get my first dog before I left for college and had a, a year to get ready for that. Um, but I found that it wasn't just getting around it. My confidence was up in things like writing a paper. My guide dog had absolutely nothing to do with my writing a paper. And yet because my, my baseline of confidence was so much higher that it started affecting other things. And Steve, I wonder about the trips that you take many years and if that is a part of the confidence you gain with your guide dog. I would say that to be true. I just returned from a conference up in Burlington a week ago. And I know that this particular dog that I have right now does extraordinarily well when I take him out of his environment and we go someplace new. He really shines because he has to think, really think about what we're doing versus a normal route in our neighborhood that's boring to him. And he did such a great job last week and it just reminded me of, like, again, I don't know that I would take trips like that. What about the storm chasing? Oh, the storm <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny, the storm chasing is kind of a hobby of mine and I, and I don't, take my dogs chasing storms with me because I think it's really unfair for them to be kind of cooped up in a van for 10, 12 hours a day. And, and when I do these trips, I, I leave my dog with people whom I trust and, and I miss him terribly when I go, but it's, it's the first couple of days are difficult because I'm in environments that I don't know and we're in different hotels every day. And so out comes the cane and for me, the word that I think of when I think of myself in a cane is vulnerable. I just feel more unsafe with a cane. Not because our dogs are trained to protect us, which they're not trained to do that, but I have a different, totally different sense about myself when I'm working a dog versus using the cane. Having said that, I have developed a great respect for the cane that I never had before. And I found that it is extremely important and extremely useful. So when I go on these trips and I have to be in different environments and different restaurants and different hotels all the time, the, the cane has taught me a lot and taught me to respect it. Although when I'm away, you know, I do miss the dog. It's interesting because I learned to respect the cane tremendously more once I was a guide dog user, which I think is really interesting because I used a cane I didn't like it, I resisted it, 
but I did use it. I recognized that it was a tool, but it wasn't until I became a guide dog user that I really began to realize that the cane is, even if it's not your primary mobility tool, still really valid, very important, and being a competent, I'll never win the, the cane using Olympics. I'll never even come <laughs> in close to bronze, but at least I'm not, I'm not gonna be kicked off the team. You know, I, <laughs> I'm not gonna embarrass myself in front of a mobility instructor if I'm using my cane, which is really the goal, um, to be at least good enough to get yourself safely from point A to point B. Um, but that is, that is really interesting. Um, we've talked some about different places that we've gone. I'm wondering about access. We all know, and I've had a, a, one of my shows was on the, the access rights of people using legitimate service dogs. But what about the fact that you can write laws till you're blue in the face? The reality is that there are people who either don't want dogs or don't know about the law or don't understand the law. Have any of you faced um, a, a situation where you had a denial of access and what is your, there's no right or wrong answer here, but what is sort of, how do you personally handle it? You know, there are lots of ways to handle it. What are the ones that you guys use? Um, Randa, you're going to well, speak. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have uh, just a few times um, in different cities uh, had someone, the host or hostess or in the restaurant, in a restaurant first say, oh, we don't allow dogs here. But I've always either said, well, by law, this uh, guide dog is allowed to go anywhere in public, so why don't you go ask your manager? Um, and then at one place, th and they, they would, and come back and say, okay, follow me <laughs> to the, the uh, a table. And then one time it was a very casual place that didn't have a manager. And I just said, that was recently actually at, at the Cape. And... Um, I said more or less the same thing, just, well, this dog is allowed by law to go anywhere. And then the waitress just said, oh, okay. <laughs> and that was it. So I haven't had any real trouble with it. Um, Gannon, I forgot to, I didn't ask you about your life being different since your dog, did I? No. Okay, I'm totally messed up. I'm sorry. This is the problem with not having a script. <laughs> so let's pretend we haven't got, gone past that topic yet. Gannon, how has your life changed? I know you said you sort of, used a cane and lost your vision, but what is, what is, how has it been for you overall with that, making that change from a, either using your vision or your cane to being a, a guide dog traveler? It's made a huge difference because like I now go to college and like, I don't think if I had to use a cane over the dog at college, I'd be completely lost. Like with, with my dog, like I can just tell her <clears throat> to go like where to go, but like I still have to know like mentally map out like where I have to go. But if I just tell her like, the direction that I want her to go, she'll do it for me. So it makes like traveling like routes much more easier. And also like with the cane, like I used to bump into a bunch of objects, didn't matter what anything. And like guide dogs are very keen to certain like objects, doesn't matter anything. Like my first guide dog hated like, um, like property signs like would, that would stick out. He would always avoid them. Which is good. Yeah. Do any of you, have any of you noticed, uh, particularly if you've been on a college campus, um, I noticed my first, I, I went with a mobility instructor and learned the campus, and of course I learned the, you know, the, pat, the, yeah. the, the sidewalks. My dog started picking up on um, worn pads like through the grass that were shortcuts, and mm -hmm. she'd start doing them, and in the beginning I was panicking, I'm like, what is she doing? And I realized that she was looking at where we were and where we had to go, and she's like, that is really silly to go all the way up to that corner and then turn, we could just do this <laughs> diagonal right here and do, have any of you guys had that experience where your dog is like totally outthinking you? Yes, <laughs> I have it now. Well, this semester I have a biology class and it's in like the admin building of the, um, my, like the admin building of campus, and there's this building like where I walk by, from like the biochemistry building and children. Thank you so much for watching this evening. It has been so interesting to have this conversation. I've encouraged everyone to come back so we can do it again. My name is Andrea Judici. You're watching As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. Don't forget to tune in next month and have a great day.